Good morning, Mercy Road Church. How are you this morning? Yes, welcome. We also wanna welcome you that are watching online right now. Can we put our hands together for everyone that's watching online right now? Welcome. We'll say hi to my mom up in Cleveland. I hope she's doing okay. Um, hey, we're excited. This is Mercy Student Takeover. Can I get a whoop whoop from all the students in the room? So basically, this is the Sunday where we empower the young people to get involved in all of the areas of the church. We believe here at Mercy Road that we don't have to wait for these kids to grow up to be used by God. Can I get an amen for that? That's awesome. God can use them right now. And so when you guys were walking in, you probably were greeted by some students. Coffee is being served by students. We got kids back here running cameras. How many guys enjoyed the student worship band up here? And Eric, of course. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. And Eric. Um, these guys, they, they're amazing. And you heard in the, uh, the announcements, we meet every Sunday night. Mercy Students meets here, middle school and high school, from 6 to 8 o'clock. And this is the worship band that we get every Sunday night. So we are extremely blessed. If you are a student or you know a student or you want to invite a student, that is our outreach opportunity. We've got so much fun that we do on Sunday nights. In fact, I got a really great compliment two weeks ago from a student. She said, Ben, every time you do something, you do it crazy. And I says, well, on a scale from 1 to 10, how crazy am I? She said 16, and that's a compliment. <laughs> So my job this morning is to just kind of give you an update of all things Mercy students. And so we've had an amazing summer. We've done a lot of swimming, a lot of fishing, a lot of, a lot of everything. I, I've been dunked and, and I've had water squirted in my ears. Um, I, usually you hear that summer is a time for rest. That does not apply to student ministers, pastors like me. Uh, I'm exhausted and I can't wait for school. Uh, but it's been an amazing summer, a lot of community, a lot of connection, a lot of bagels with Ben. But the two big highlights were the retreats that we did. Because these weren't just retreats, these were also service opportunities. As a parent, I'm always looking for opportunities to stretch my kids, to get them involved, to empower them, for them to realize, hey, God can use me even as a young person. And so in June, we took our middle school students down to Columbus, Indiana, to a camp where we cleaned and got that, that camp ready for camp. And so all day Saturday, we had kids uh, laying out mulch, picking weeds. We had one girl wake up the next morning. She's like, I dreamt all night about picking weeds. <laughs> yeah, Faith, there you are. <laughs> are you still dreaming about that? So <laughs> we had kids cleaning bathrooms. We had kids cleaning the kitchen. Probably my favorite quote of the weekend from Jaden Brown was this. I cannot even clean my room, and I just cleaned six cabins. Miracles can happen. There's a, so after we did all this cleaning, we had a great night with the bonfire and all that stuff. And then on Sunday, we went down to Holiday World and we did the water park and took advantage of the endless soda, um, which by the way is a scary thing to see students go back for the soda again and again and again. But here's the thing that really inspired me. On the drive back, I heard a lot of the students talking about the highlight of the weekend and it wasn't Holiday World and it wasn't the sodas. It was getting that camp ready for the campers. To hear students say that, you're like, okay, this is worth it. This is worth it. Last week, we had our high school retreat. We went downtown. We partnered with Larry Hackett and his outpost to the homeless community. And, and I didn't know how this was going to go. I really didn't. I prayed about it. I'm like, hey, let's see what the students do. Some of these students have never been downtown, and they've definitely never been to this part of downtown. And so the first challenge was, is, hey, guys, get as much stuff as you want that you think will serve the homeless that we can put into these bags. And so we got toilet paper, we got hand sanitizer, we got sunscreen, beef jerky, M&Ms, airheads, all kinds of stuff. And we packed these bags brim full, 50 of them. And so we get down there and I'm thinking, you know, some of these students, they're, they're going to be a little bit freaked out and the interaction is going to simply be, here's your bag. And then they're going to, you know, kind of just stand back and wait to see what happens. Instead, these kids, man, they owned it. It was so inspiring to see them hand these bags out and then start asking these individuals compassionately curious questions. We had some kids talking to some individuals for like 45 minutes because these people just wanted to, to tell their story. And so it was just, it's been an amazing summer, but we are heading into the school year. Praise Jesus, right? All your parents are ready for the kids to go back to school. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> we, got one, we got one mom back there. Let's do the wave. Anyway. So a couple things to uh, mark down in your calendar. If you're a student or a parent of a student, September 11th is going to be our official fall kickoff, back to school kickoff. Now, I don't know what we're doing yet, but I tell you what, I'm going to try to come up with something crazy, okay? So something that's going to be completely memorable. Kids will love it. It'll freak parents out. You know it's going to be good. All right, that's September 11th. 
Until then, just so you know, we are continuing to meet on Sunday nights, so you're definitely welcome to come out to that. Our big thing, and you heard this in the announcements, and, and I made sure that we put this up today because I, I want to make sure that any kid that wants to go on this gets to go to this. We did a fall retreat last year with the other Mercy Road locations, and it was amazing. We had Eric Maitland out there leading worship. Um, It was one of the most powerful weekends that we've ever had with Mercy students, and we have all of those locations trying to sign up. So we want to make sure that if if your kids want to go, that they get signed up now. So we have that early bird registration. If you click that QR code right in front of you right there, you can register today. All right, more details will come about all the stuff that we're gonna do there. Also, the other one, and you heard this in the announcements, we do need some people to listen to that nudge of the Holy Spirit to sponsor some kids. Uh, You know, because we got a bus two and a half hours away, you know, it gets a little bit expensive. And so we could really use some sponsors to scholarship some kids to go to that camp. So also on that QR code, if you scan that, scroll down, you'll find Mercy Students Giving and you can give specifically for that retreat. All right. And you just give what the Lord leads you. All right. Okay. So that's the update. Is that okay? Good. One big clap for the update. One, two, three. Bam. Okay. Now. Wednesday, we, we actually were going through all this on Wednesday. I was supposed to give all this update, and then I was supposed to introduce our newest pastor, Jeremy Leffler. Clap your hands if you've had a chance to meet Jeremy Leffler. I love this guy. He is amazing. I, I'm super surprised that they hired him because now they got two extreme ADDers on the staff, me and Jeremy, and we work together really well. We get nothing done, but we work really well together. Jeremy stayed up all night on Tuesday working through this message, and he went through it on Wednesday, and it was absolutely amazing, and you're not going to get to hear a word of it. Because on Thursday, I got a text message from him saying, hey, I'm under the weather. You got to take it. And so I'm going to be sharing uh, the message today. And so what I want to do now is just go to God and pray, because I've only had a day and a half to work on this. And so we want to make sure that God's in it, all right? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for this morning. Um, God, I thank you for what you've already done in the last two services. Lord, I thank you for Mercy Student Takeover. I know that this is a time for us to focus on students, but Lord, I don't want to forget about the young adults. I thank you for uh, Jeremy, and I I do pray that you would just be with him right now as he's on the mend. Um, But what he's doing with the young adults, Father, is such an inspiration. It's something that I've been praying for for years. And now the young adults here in our church can find community. And so, Lord, we just pray for that. But Lord, as we step into a time of of message, I pray that our hearts would be open, that we would be alert, that my ADD would be kept at bay, that you'd help me to focus, and that everything that is shared on this stage would be for your glory alone. We thank you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray these things. Amen. This morning, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about the Apostle Paul in his relationship with this disciple by the name of Timothy. Now, to understand and get an idea of what's going on here, we've got to do a little bit of backstory on the Apostle Paul. Maybe some of you have heard this name before. If you want to read about Paul, who's also known as Saul, you can find that in the book of Acts. Basically, Paul hated Christians. He persecuted them, and he loathed them. He was one of those individuals that he wanted to wipe everything off the face of the earth that had to do with the love of Jesus. If you were somebody and you walked up to Paul and said, I love Jesus, he literally had wanted to kill you. In fact, he oversaw the stoning of Stephen and he did did unmentionable heinous things. And then he's on this road to Damascus and Paul would describe it like this, that God showed him grace and mercy by literally striking him down and making him blind. And for three days... Paul encountered Jesus. Another disciple by the name of Ananias comes along and prays over him, and these scales fall from his eyes, and Paul is literally transformed. He is baptized, and only days later, he is out preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine being part of the Jewish community? Your brother, Paul, who's this Jewish guy going around persecuting Christians, is now preaching the good news of Jesus. How crazy that must have sounded. How crazy that must have been. But that is what happens when you encounter Christ. And that is my first point this morning. When you open up your heart to Jesus and you receive that incredible gift, there is a radical transformation. You are no longer who you used to be. In fact, the Bible says it like this. Anyone who is in Christ becomes a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. And we see this radical transformation happen in Paul. And in some of you, 
Just hearing that are reminded of your radical transformation. That moment where you got that holy slap upside the head, where your eyes were open and you began to realize, oh my gosh, this Jesus truly loves me. And then you gave your life to him. Some of you can relate to Paul. And, and, and if Paul were here right now, he'd probably describe himself as a dirty dog. In fact, he even describes himself in the Bible as the chief sinner. He was the worst of the worst of the worst. And some of you can relate to that. I try not to get into debates with people on spiritual things. If God opens up a door to have a conversation with somebody and I sense that they're open to listening and they're really wanting to know, I'm gonna dive into that all day long. But there are moments where you're gonna be kind of lured into or there's the temptation to get sucked into a debate where there are some people that they just wanna argue. They just wanna argue and they just wanna prove their point and prove you wrong. And sometimes I get sucked into those. I try not to. But I remember one time getting sucked into this debate and the big thing that this person was stuck on was they kept saying, Ben, Christians think that they're perfect. They think they're better than everybody else. And as soon as she said that, I started to laugh. I said, I'm sorry, but you are really misinformed. Because when a person proclaims to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus, basically what they are admitting is I fall short. I am a sinner. I am broken. And because of my sin, because of my brokenness, the Bible is very clear that we deserve death and I need a savior and that savior is Jesus Christ. And because I am saved, I live my life in such a way to give God the glory. Can I get an amen this morning? We don't think that we're perfect. In fact, Paul, he would stand up here and say, I was the worst of the worst of the worst, but by grace and mercy, I am saved. And that is the radical transformation when you realize that you are saved and that that's eternal. How can that not change your life? Some of you can relate to Paul and his transformation. My heart leans a little bit more towards the story of the leper. Now, we've just spent most of the summer in the book of Judges, and I tell you what, that's a, that's a tough book to get through, and I think the pastors did an amazing job getting through that, but I'm excited this morning. We're going to jump into the Gospels now, and uh, for those of you that don't know, and I teach this to my students all the time, the Gospel literally means the good news of Jesus Christ. So are you guys ready for some good news this morning? Okay, so if you've got your Bibles with you, you can turn to or flip on your phone, and I want you guys to jump into the Gospel of Matthew chapter 8. And we're going to talk a little bit about the story of the man with leprosy. I so relate to this individual. You see, a leper was somebody who was an outcast. A leper was somebody who was always on the outskirts looking in. A lepers were the, the forgotten, the left behind, and they felt it. They had this contagious disease and, and, and everybody was afraid uh, that they were going to catch it. So they all avoided you. If they saw you, they'd probably run and scream. And then not only that, you, you by law, if you saw somebody who was not a leper walking towards you, you had to scream out one of the most humiliating things. You had to scream out at the top of your lungs a warning to those that were approaching. You'd have to scream out, unclean, unclean. Don't come near me, I'm a leper. Don't come near me. I got a contagious disease, don't come near me. Or you're gonna be living in a cave with me. Unclean. And so as far as community, they had none. And so we see this leper, it says here in, in, in chapter eight, verse one, when he came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. They're talking about Jesus. Verse two, a man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. We don't know the backstory about this individual. We don't know how long he's been a leper. We don't know if he's got a family. We don't know if he's got kids. But we do know that he's been alone and he's desperate. Because what he does here is he breaks the law. He's not allowed to go near people that don't have leprosy. He's not allowed to do what he did. And so there's this incredible desperate desire to meet Jesus. Maybe he had heard about it from some other individuals. Maybe he was kind of, you know, earshot away and he'd picked up on a few things to the point where he had an incredible amount of hope and a desperation so much so that he said, I am going to break the law. I'm going to go find this Jesus guy and I'm going to kneel before him because I need, I need him. He goes to Jesus and he says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Something that we forget is that people don't touch lepers. 
Man, if this guy was a leper for 10 years, can you imagine not having any type of human contact for that long? Can you imagine if this man had a daughter that he hadn't been able to hug for 10 years? Jesus could have said, hey, be healed. That's not what he did. He literally reaches out and he puts his hand on the man, touches him on the shoulder. Can you imagine if you hadn't been touched in over a decade and now this man is touching you on the shoulder, what that would have done inside of you, the overwhelming feeling of, oh my gosh, I haven't felt this for so long. And then waiting with anticipation for which way is this gonna go? Is he willing? And then Jesus says, I am willing, be clean." You know, I've read this passage so many times, and, and I love how when we read the Bible and we study the Word, he, God reveals us new things all the time, even little things. At the end of the word clean, there's an exclamation point. I'm not great in grammar. You know, I was that special ed kid. I, I love spell check. I thank God every day for Grammarly, but I know what an exclamation point is. I am a walking exclamation point. <laughs> it means that when Jesus said, be clean, he said it... it with energy, he said it in a way that everybody would hear it, that there would be no debate on what was going on. Be clean. I love how people like to say that there's no humor in the Bible. I love to laugh. I love humor. I think that is a gift from God. We need to do that more in our society. Um, and right after this, I find it very funny what happens next. So Jesus heals this man, and then right away he says, hey, don't tell anybody. Uh, that I did this. I want you to go see the priest and give an offering, you know, and all that stuff. And I'm thinking to myself, how can you not tell somebody? I mean, you just healed me. Can you imagine going home and, and all of the bandages are gone and your skin has been restored and, and, and you're completely, the disease is completely gone and you're walking to your family? How are, they're going to have some questions here. What are, what are you going to say? You know, you're going to make something up. Uh, you didn't want me to say nothing. They're going to be like, hey, did you find some kind of a, a, a creamy, rich lotion that just wiped that away? It's called Jergens. You know what? <laughs> oh, man, I would, I would have to apologize right away to Jesus, and I'd have to say, I'm sorry, but I have to tell everybody. And that's what happens. That's what happened with Paul. This radical transformation created a desperate desire to, to desperately share Jesus with those who desperately needed to hear the good news. When you encounter Jesus and he begins to transform your life, you just want to tell everybody. So I go to camp and God grabs a hold of my heart and I come home and my life has changed. I'm different. My family knows it. Last, the, it was a couple of weeks ago, I was hanging out with my brother and my daughter and we were joking and, and we were talking a little bit about this and he said, yeah, it was crazy. Ben came home from camp and he's singing these songs that we never heard before and he's starting to read this book called the Bible. We thought he was kind of weird. They thought I'd lost my mind because they'd never seen this kind of side of me before. But there was this radical transformation in my life, and all I wanted was my, for my family to hear the good news. Then I shared as much as I could, but you see, here's what's going to happen. Sometimes you're going to meet somebody, and you just sharing your story of Jesus touching your life will be enough. But then you're going to share your story with some individuals who've got a lot of hurts and a lot of walls in their life, and they're going to have a few more questions. And so you need to have been discipled. You need to have been taught a few things so that you could encourage them and point them in that direction of Christ. But you don't know what you don't know. And so I come home and I'm trying to explain to my mom and I'm trying to explain to my dad and I'm trying to explain to my girlfriend, hey, there's this Jesus and he saves and I just didn't know enough. I didn't understand because when I came home, I didn't have anybody to disciple me. We didn't go to church. And the parachurch ministry that sponsored me to go to this camp did not have the structure to have somebody come alongside me and disciple me. And so what happens to so many is we have this encounter with Christ and then the enemy takes advantage. It's, he takes advantage of this situation. Oh, nobody has stepped up. Nobody's taken the opportunity. And he, man, the enemy is good at what he does. And so what he, do, he does is he tries to isolate you a little bit more. He tries to, you know, cause you to start looking back at your old life. And, and, he, and he tries to suck you back into the old way of thinking. And, and, and sort of, instead of getting discipled and growing in your faith and cultivating that seed that was planted, you start backsliding and getting sucked back into that old way of thinking. I got this great quote from my main man, Max Licato. I love Max. I love his stuff. He keeps it so simple. You see, all of us follow someone. We all do. 
As a believer in Christ, we hope that that person that we are following or that people are following, that our students are following, are a believer in Christ. That's what we hope. Here's a quote from Matthew. In our faith, we leave footprints to guide others. A child, a friend, a recent convert. Here's my point. Listen to this, young people. None should be left to walk the trail alone. None of us should be walking this alone. When we have that radical transformation in our life, we need individuals to come alongside of us, to pour in us, to guide us, to inspire us, to correct us, to disciple us. In fact, we say this almost every Sunday. We believe that nobody is too far from God to be discipled into a loving relationship with Jesus Christ. What does it mean to be a disciple? That means to be a student, to be teachable, to learn. You can be teachable and you can have a desire to learn, but you've got to have people willing to pour into you. You've got to have a Paul. Why do we need this? Because this Christian life is really hard. I know that I say this almost every time I'm up on stage. It's the Great Commission. You know, in Matthew, at the very end, Jesus says, therefore, go make disciples of all nations. Notice that there are no parameters there. He doesn't say, hey, therefore, go if you want to be a pastor. Therefore, go if you've got this GPA. Therefore, go if you feel confident enough. No, he basically says, therefore, go. That is to all of us who've been radically changed by the loving grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. If you've been radically transformed by Christ, we are now supposed to go make disciples. There are going to be moments in your journey where you're going to meet that random person on an airplane and God's going to give you that nudge. Hey, tell them your story. And it's a really cool experience when you meet somebody random that you've never met before and and God says, hey, tell them your story. And you, you lead them through your story and maybe even pray with them to receive Christ. That's a cool thing. Or maybe you'll be over at Kroger and you're wearing your your live boldly, love deeply shirt and somebody's like, hey, what's that whole thing about? Gives you an opportunity to share with a complete stranger. It's kind of awesome. And any of those opportunities that God nudges you into, take advantage of them. They're really awesome. But there's also another nudge. One that's a little bit more scary because there's a greater level of commitment. That is that nudge of the Holy Spirit saying, hey, I want you to now walk alongside somebody. I want you to commit your your time, your talent, and your treasure to walking along somebody and discipling them, pouring into them, because without you, they will get sucked back into that old life. They need somebody to teach them and train them and love on them. They need a Paul to their Timothy. Why do we need this? Because it's stinking hard. And Paul knew all about that. And I think about what Paul had before he started uh, his ministry, before this radical transformation. And and I I have this visual. I had this visual of Paul and somebody asking him, maybe it's me, saying, was it worth it? Paul, was it worth giving up all that stuff? What do you have left, Paul? What do you have left to show for your life? If you'd had stayed a Jew in Jerusalem, you'd have a seat of status and a house of retirement and you'd have all the money in the world. Had you been more compromising, you might have gone unnoticed and the, Rome would have not noticed you and you could have avoided jail twice. You could have avoided getting beat up. Had you been less passionate, listen to this, had you been less passionate and desperate to share Jesus, you might have just simply pastored a church and stayed in one location, but you were too convinced to compromise, too desperate to share the good news to stay home. And so Paul, I ask you, what do you have left? And I picture this 70-year-old man or so with a twinkle in his eyes replying simply, I have my faith. Paul kept his faith. And it was that example that he then poured into Timothy. Not only did he give these words of encouragement to Timothy, but he showed him by example how to live his life. He actually wrote 1 Timothy while he was sitting in jail. And he knew that Timothy, he'd heard Timothy's getting his butt kicked out there in Ephesus. 
Timothy was out there in one of the fifth largest cities and he was trying to get it done, but he's in a situation where there's a lot of evil things going on. And so he's in this city, Ephesus, which is the fifth largest city around. There's a lot of people, lots of sin, lots of struggle. This city was famous for its temples dedicated to the goddess uh, Artemis and was the, the influential center. Listen to this. It was the influential center of pagan worship. That just sounds bad. This fact combined with the influx of false teaching. So now you got not only this pagan worship, but also you've got these individuals that are tickling the ears with all of this false teaching, made it extremely difficult for Timothy to lead a Christian community in the city. And so Paul writes this letter to Timothy to encourage him, to motivate him, to inspire him, and to give him guidance. Listen to the inspiring tone of Paul's words, all of which point back to the good news of Jesus Christ, the anchor of our faith. Everything that, 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 that Paul's writing to Timothy all comes back to Jesus. Listen to what he writes in 1 Timothy 1, 6, 12. It says this, fight the good fight of the faith. Hold on to the eternal life to which you were called when you, were, when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Y'all know that I run that boxing gym and when I read this and when I read this, I get inspired because the Christian life is hard and we have got to fight. But here's the best part. We don't gotta fight alone. We don't have to fight alone. Timothy had a spiritual father. And so for some of us in this room, we need to step up and be just that, a spiritual father or a spiritual mother. We need to stop making excuses. We got to stop trying to figure out how to schedule it up. And we just got to say, God, yes, I'm going to come alongside. I'm going to dedicate and I'm going to pour into the younger generation so they know how to fight the good fight. Listen to what he says in 1 Timothy 4.12. Do not let anyone look down on you because you are young. And when I see this praise band get up here and I see your son up here jumping around, man, it just warms my heart. First of all, I wish I could jump like that. He gets some air. You know what I love about that? And I know Isaiah, and I've been around Isaiah. This is not anything but an authentic love for Jesus. When you get to know him and you see him and you just talk to him, you know that he is just falling more and more in love with Jesus. And he wants, when he's up here, just to praise God. And to see these young people, listen to what it says, don't let anyone put you down because you're wrong. Listen to this part. But set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. And the only way that Timothy could do these things is that he first saw Paul do them. Paul set the example so that Timothy could do these things and hang on to this faith, that he could keep the faith, that he could run this race with perseverance, fixing his eyes on Jesus. This Christian life is stinking hard. We need one another. That's why we have community. I had a Paul. His name was Bill Leach. I met him when I was about 19 years old and we became really good friends and he was a performing chalk artist for like 50 years. And one summer, he asked me if I'd take over all of his camps. He said, he called me up, I was in my dorm and he says, Ben, hey, um, I know you do a little bit of art. Would you uh, be interested in taking over for me? I'm just, you know, running out of energy. And so I was like, hey, if you show me how to do the art and you show me how to set up your equipment, yeah, I'll give it a shot. Here's the crazy thing. Bill never once showed me how to draw anything. <laughs> He never once showed me how to set up his equipment. I remember trying to set up his easel one time and on the very back of it, there's this huge magnet with like wing nuts and screws and stuff. And I'm like, Bill, what's this for? He's like, well, parts fall out all the time and I don't know where they go, so I just put them there. <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, he's not gonna show me anything. And I kept bugging him, I'm like, Bill, I gotta do these drawings. I don't know how to draw anything. And he's just like, don't worry about the art. You'll figure it out. The art will take care of itself. We'll take care of the art later. He kept saying this, Ben, don't worry about the art. Let's focus on the heart. And every time I get with him, we'd, go, he'd, we'd have these things he called fireside chats, where it's basically him talking about Jesus and, then, and showing me different things in the Bible about Jesus, asking me what my favorite scriptures were, asking me what he could pray for. And that's all we ever did. And that's all I ever needed. I only had Bill for a year, and then he died. But now I was out there doing ministry, like full time, going around and preaching and doing different things. And guys, eventually it got really, 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 really hard to the point where it's actually a miracle that I still perform with chalk. I almost quit. I love my brothers over, my brothers and sisters over in Illinois, but when you go over and you speak in a public school in Illinois, they are very, very strict about the separation between church and state. 
If you say anything about Jesus, if you quote scripture or even talk about God, they will come down on you. I've seen it firsthand. I'll never forget, I was about 22 years old. I'm up in Buffalo Grove, Illinois. Usually when you meet somebody who brings you in to their school to speak to their students, they're pretty nice. Not this time. I walk into the the gymnasium and the principal would not even shake my hand. He starts pointing at me and he says, I know who you are. I know what you're about. If you say the name Jesus, if I hear anything about you, about God, or you quote scripture, we will prosecute you. We will send you to jail. And he literally points over to a police officer that he brought in special for me that day. He says, I didn't want you here. It was the student government that wanted you here. Have a good show. He and the officer left for about an hour while we were setting up, and I took my road manager at the time, and I says, hey, you know what? We need to go pray. And we went around 2,500 chairs and prayed for every single one of them. He didn't know about that. Ended up getting, it was actually a really good show. We got a standing ovation from 25 high school students. That's hard to do. And, and I, it was such a good show. And, and so I was up on stage and I'm getting the standing ovation without even thinking. I raise my hand and I say, I want to thank you so much for being a great audience and may God bless you. And as soon as I said that, I look over at the principal. Am I going to jail? I didn't go to jail that day. Murfreesboro, Illinois went a little bit different though. I went to this school and I didn't realize that it was a school program. Uh, you know, I was 19 years old and, and uh, my attention to detail was very little. You know, when you book a show, you should probably get a little bit more information about what they want. It was being paid for and sponsored by a church. And so there was a little communication issue there. And so I preached, I shared scripture, I shared Jesus. I even drew a cross. I'm surprised they let me finish. When I got done, my client came up to me and she blasted me. She started screaming and yelling at me about how she was going to sue and press charges and all these things. I basically took a verbal beating, and I've never had that happen before. When I got done, I was so beaten up inside that I can remember going to the hotel with my brother and looking at him saying, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. I didn't realize it was going to be this hard. And so we're driving three hours back to Rockville, Indiana, and we're just trying to figure out how we're going to plan our lives out now without chalk art, without ministering get home and in God's great sense of humor, I go to my answering machine and I hit the play button and there's a message from a guy by the name of Larry Metcalf who was a director at a camp and he said, hey, Ben, would you be interested to do seven weeks of camp for the Fellowship Christian Athletes? I call Larry up right away and I said, Larry, I got some bad news for you. I'm giving it up. And he says, no, you're not. You're not quitting. Quitting is not an option. He became my Paul. We went and we had coffee and I told him what had happened. I said, man, it was so hard. I've never, ever been beaten up like that before. He said, Ben, when did you ever hear that this was going to be easy? Nobody ever said it was going to be easy. Read through the Bible, Ben. Look at what they do to Christians. They persecute them. They put him down, they beat him. Look what they did to Jesus. They nailed him across. Nobody ever said it was going to be easy. But why do we do it? Why do we do this, Ben? Why? Because when somebody gives their life to Jesus, the radical transformation is eternal and it's worth it every time. Did you hear that? When we receive that gift of Jesus, The difference is eternal. So Larry comes aside, man. He's my Paul. For a few years, and then he went to Minnesota, and I came down here to Indiana. And and then, crazy enough, several years later, God orchestrated it for him to actually come on the road with me for three years. He he, He called himself my road manager, my chaperone, and my chauffeur. And really what he was was my Paul because man, every time we get in that car and we go on these road trips, he would constantly pour things into me, pour and pour and pour. He would teach me, he would guide me, he would pray with me. He'd say things like this, Ben, let's make the main thing the main thing today. Let's serve some Jesus. Let's serve Jesus. He would correct me. I remember one time I go down to Miami. I'm super exhausted. I had these shows in Idaho and Colorado. And so I thought it would be smart to grab one of those five iron energy drinks. By the way, if you ever see me with one of those, take it away. And so I slammed this five-hour energy, and I went up, and I did 
45 minutes of the best comedy material. It was Comedy Central. I had people rolling in the aisles. I had a guy come up to me afterwards. He says, I have never laughed so hard. My side is still hurting. And I thought that I hit a home run. I thought I nailed it out the park. And we get in the car and my Paul, my Larry looks at me and he said, where was Jesus tonight? Where was Jesus? I got so caught up with the laughter that I forgot to even share the good news. That's what he did for three years. One of the reasons that I love being here at this church is because now I have a new Paul and he's only an office away from me. Man, I have questions. I got concerns. I need prayers. And I'll go over to this guy by the name of Greg Strand. And I'll, I even asked him before I came up, Greg, what's this word? He didn't know it. I didn't know it, so I didn't say it. But the one thing that I love about Greg is <laughs> literally before the first service, I'm running around, you know, it's Mercy Student Takeover. I'm trying to make sure kids are over there. Where's the donuts, all that stuff. And Greg grabs me in the office and he says, hey, let's pray for an anointing right now. That's what a Paul does. There's a nudge, the nudge of the Holy Spirit. I don't know why God works in still gentle whispers, but he does. Pastor Josh, sometimes he jokes and he says, you know, sometimes we'll feel this nudge of the Holy Spirit and we mistake it for a bad burrito from the night before. Because it's so subtle, that's the way that God works. Maybe God works in still gentle whispers because he wants to make sure that we're paying attention. He wants to make sure that we're ready for that moment when he calls us to get in the game. I do believe in my heart that God, he's nudging some of you this morning. I've been praying all week that he'd make that nudge a little bit more of a shove today. For some of you in this room, I'm gonna flip the switch a little bit. It may be the nudge to actually choose to be discipled. Some of you have been coming here on Sunday mornings and you've been enjoying all of this, but you haven't stepped into community. You need to be discipled. And we've got so many wonderful things at this church just for that because we believe that nobody is too far from God to be discipled into a loving relationship with Jesus. We've got outposts, we've got rooted, we've got huddles, we've got Sunday night. That may be you. You may be a young adult and you're looking for some community and I guarantee you, if you get with Jeremy Leffler, they got it going on now. They had a barbecue a while back. I'd never seen more young adults together. They had like 30 people barbecuing and playing volleyball, eating s'mores. For some of you, that nudge is to finally say yes to stop making excuses, to be that spiritual father, to be that spiritual mother, to somebody who so desperately wants to get more acquainted with Jesus. And so this leper goes to Jesus, desperate, falls to his knees and says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus replies, I am willing. This morning, are you willing? Are you willing to say yes? To let God use you in a mighty way? Because he can. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for the nudge. I wouldn't be here without it. And so, Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would move this morning in a mighty, mighty way. That there would be no excuses, that there would be no, nothing distracting, that there'd be no mistake, Father, that you can use us and, and we need to be used by you. We need that spiritual father and that spiritual mother. We need those willing to lead us and guide us and mold us, to correct us, to inspire us. So, Father, I pray before we leave this place, those that need to will say yes. Thank you for using us, Father. It's in your name we pray these things. Amen.